With me in the studio is the director of Grounded, Maggie Roop, and Bianca Bryan. What is the play about Grounded? So the play is, um, it's a one-woman show, and it's about a fighter pilot who uh, finds out that she's going to have a baby, and she is grounded and reassigned to a drone. And um, we see what happens to her through that transition and how the, the new drone position affects her psychologically. It's a fascinating uh, subject. Bianca, what drew you to it? Well, I had heard about the play uh, probably about a year prior, and I knew the synopsis of the play. And I was actually totally scared to death of it. <laughs> I didn't even go into the initial auditions because I was too scared. <laughs> and then I got an email from uh, some of the folks at Theater Lab saying, will you please come into the callbacks for this? And I knew the premise of the play. And of course, I was exhilarated by the idea of it, but the the petrified part of me was taking mm -hmm. over. But I said, all right, if they've asked me to come into the callbacks directly, I, I need to go in for this. So I read the play. And I mean, after I read the play, Oh, my gosh. I, I just found so many parallels. Obviously, I'm not a fighter pilot. I'm an actress. But I found so many parallels in my life today with trying to balance work and family life and all of that and try and satisfy all parts of myself personally that I was like, this this is a character that I would love to play. And so... And so then the story really captivated me when I read it. And then I went into the callbacks and the rest is kind of history. <laughs> I was fascinated when um, you were telling me about uh, the length of it. It's 85 minutes, one woman, nobody else on the stage. Mm -hmm. And yet um, no intermission too, right? No intermission. Right. To me, that is just, you know, mind boggling too. <laughs> it's, it's a sprint for sure. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of material for Bianca to learn. And um, something interesting that you don't get to see if you don't actually get to read the play is that it's not written in traditional prose. It's almost written in a in poetic stanzas. Okay. So um, yeah, George Brandt, the playwright, has really created a specific language and a specific tempo for the way that this character speaks and expresses herself. So not only is it a lot of language to learn, it's almost, I think, like learning a different language, kind of like Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. I, you, I was going to yeah, say, it sounds exactly. Shakespearean. Yeah. Uh -huh. it's, it's, has a, it's all modern language, but it has a sort of heightened feel because um, the playwright has really structured it in such a way so that you can follow the clues and the hints that are given to you in the length of each line and, and the shape of the stanza. And and it, it just guides you from beginning to end yep. as an actor and as a director. Now, Absolutely. Did, does the author have military background? No, not that I know of. Um, the The snippets that I've watched about him talking about this play, he said he was fascinated with the idea of drones. And so he went into it just to explore that. And then when he realized that drones are actually being flown out of our country, out of the U.S., he, he didn't know that. And that pulled him in even further into the story of the pilots. And he thought it was so fascinating that these pilots go to war during the day and then right. go home at night and you know uh, she says this in the play most people transition home once a year these pilots transition home every single night being at war during the day or night depending on their shift um so that really pulled him into that side of the story and then um when he was doing his research i think he started it correct me if i'm wrong as a male role but then for some reason he transferred over to uh, turning it into a woman's story because of the the um, family side of life mm -hmm. and thinking about how you know how a maternal instinct would you know would relate and and develop as as this process went along so that the balance might be more difficult I don't know if that's necessarily true but having a baby having a baby at home and then a child at home and then going to war and doing what you do I mean Ooh, I can't imagine. It's still harrowing, and we've been in rehearsals three weeks, 
three and a half weeks, and the story just doesn't lose any potency at all. Uh, that, it fascinates me on so many different levels. I think I saw something, uh, it may have been 60 Minutes a while ago, where they profile these drone operators, and it's exactly that. You know, for eight hours a day, you're in this little box or shed, and um, it's like a video game, except that exactly. people are dying. Exactly. You know? She says that in the in the play. She says, video games have color. I have gray. It's right. And I've heard that actually some of the training exercises that the Air Force is doing are are all video games. They're kind of recruiting that way. And what we get to see in the play is we see the pilot, um, which is technically the character's name. We see the pilot um, make that observation at the beginning of her um, of her service as a drone pilot. And then we see it becoming more and more real for her because it, you know, it feels far away. It feels like a, a video game at first. And then slowly she realizes that she's seeing body parts and she's recognizing the reality that's on the other end of, of this interaction that she's having through this drone. Mm -hmm. Uh, it has to be harrowing. Is there a, um, in the, the writing, um, are you taken down into different layers of descent into the, uh, the, the, uh, the horror of what's going on? Oh, definitely. That's exactly right. That is basically the, the premise of the second half of the play, really. That, that, and as Maggie was saying, in the beginning, she's looking at this screen and she looks at the screen and there's this level of detachment. But as the play goes on, I mean, the screen, she says, it becomes part of your world. So it becomes real, real life to her. This um, production is part of the Cellar series at Theater Lab. And the theme for the series is when the other becomes the self. And what we what we sort of see happening to her in, in a sort of increasingly voyeuristic way is her becoming more and more connected and empathetic toward her targets. And um, that's a, a very strong theme mm -hmm. throughout the play. And it, it, that's sort of what it evolves into throughout the second half and then to the end. Mm -hmm. I would think um, if you're directing a play with you know, 10, 15, 20 people, it would probably, I, I'm thinking, be much easier because it must be incredibly intense. Just mm -hmm. you have your ideas, I suppose, interpretation, and you have yours as an actress. Um, how does that level out, or how do you come to uh, to grips with that? Well, um, well, first of all, this is the third time I've had the pleasure of directing Bianca, and okay. I think we found that we have sort of a language that we speak together, and we. Uh, we have similar processes and we're often sort of on the same page um, without even having to work to get there. But um, in terms of the the structure of the play as a one woman play, um, some, something that I love about theater is that it often, even if you do have all of the characters being acted out in front of you, it requires you to use your imagination. And um, I, I've, I've heard this before, and I truly believe that the imagination is directly linked to your ability to empathize. And I think that that is a tool that George Brandt has used by forcing us to imagine the other people that she encounters and to imagine um, all of the different locations that she describes to us. We are we are made to put ourselves in her shoes and to start considering what what that would mean for us. And um, and uh, that's why this play fits so beautifully into the theme of the season. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, it's been performed all over the world. Yeah, I've actually found translations um, in Germany. Um, <laughs> and yeah, it started in... Well, I'm, it started before, but but its highest profile was at the Public in New York City, and Anne Hathaway starred in it in New York City. Uh -huh. And then now it's being performed regionally all over the place because I think it's such a topical conversation that that people 
don't know is happening right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, true. this is not a true story, but it is based on, I think, people's true experiences. So it's it's very, very important to be told right now. You know, it, it sounds endlessly fascinating from what I saw on TV. These operators, they, they seem so normal, but they're doing the same thing. Of course, the day is over. You're eight hours or whatever. You're going back to your family, and who knows what, you know, what's going on on the inside of these people, mm-hmm. you know, and how they bottle up. From a um, a directing point of view, I would imagine um, it had to be incredibly challenging to do blocking <laughs> and uh, shift changes within, um, I, I'm guessing, lighting, you know, have mm-hmm. plays a, a part of that too. Talk about that. Yes, this uh, play is very reliant on lighting to set the, the scene. Um one of the requirements of the play, as asked of the producers and the director by the playwright, is um, that it be abstract or start maybe more literal and then become more abstract. So um, that that's part of the challenge, and um, it's, it was an idea that I just loved, and it has been it has been difficult to sort of suss out the clarity of what part of the stage indicates what area but we have been able to do that and and throughout the whole process um i've kept reminding bianca that if she's very very clear about where she is and what her focal points are and the reality of each location for her then we'll be able to to sense that and and become a part of it with her well, and that's something that Maggie's so brilliant at, because when I first read the script, I was like, oh, so basically I sit in a chair the whole time and that's the play. <laughs> but now that I've been under Maggie's direction, like there are parts of the stage that are so clearly a place for me now. Like I have home, I have my car, I have my daughter's room. Uh, we even go into a shopping mall, like, and it's so clear in my mind exactly where I am, what I'm seeing. But you know, there is nothing there. There's there's a chair and we have some chalk on the ground and some cables and a monitor. So that's another way where the audience really has to engage their own imaginations and, and see the spaces that this pilot is in. That's a good point. That ties into what I was thinking, too. Um, given the, How big is the stage? Hmm. It's like a black box theater type of feel. Black box theater, and I would say it's probably approximately 20 by 30 feet okay so everything is utilized the entire yeah. space is utilized mm-hmm. yeah okay. now you mentioned imagination a number of times are there um augmenting clips or slides or sound effects uh that you react to or the audience reacts to yes um really good question there's there are some um sound effects that are in the script that we are honoring and then we are, ha, are have added some other sound effects to move the action forward um one of the um one of the consistent set dressing choices or scene design choices um that the folks at theater lab made for the seller series um was to have a, a, a projection screen so there have been projections for the other two plays in the series um and for this one, we are using projections, but again, they're going to be very abstract. Um, they will assist you in getting a sense of where you are and um, and what what the feeling of that place is at that moment. But everything everything is is abstracted. Uh huh. It, it's such a fascinating uh, concept to do it, and I, I still I don't think a day has gone by when since Bianca told me about this. So I'm thinking eighty five minutes. <laughs> I don't, well, there's nothing in, nobody in, in a Shakespearean play has that kind of length of time, you know, mm-hmm. right? Um, and and there are people's, uh, you know, you hear about this. I've never actually seen it done. There's one radio host, a Christian host I know does books of the Bible, you know, around the world. Mm-hmm. And that's pretty daunting. And I think uh, somebody has done it with a, uh, a Dickens play, Christmas Carol. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Right? Um, but 85 minutes. I know. <laughs> and it, it sounds very, you know, I was thinking conversational dialogue, you know, muttering to yourself or whatever. But when you mentioned the fact that it's it's kind of uh, uh, 
a type of a patterning that goes on, like uh, I guess quatrains or whatever, or, or kind of poetry that goes on too. How does one begin to? Um, I guess that's for both of you to answer. How does an actress begin to learn that, and how do you, as a director, conceptualize that? Should I go first? Sure. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, all right. So, um, as an actor, I memorize uh, physically and visually to an extent. So, I had read this play numerous times before we started rehearsals, but by uh, when I got to Maggie, I was probably quarter of the way there, maybe halfway there. Uh-huh. But um, once the physicalization is added, then I can really kind of solidify what I'm doing when and what language goes with that. Okay. Um, and so that has made it clearer. And there are patterns in the text. It's really interesting this, now that I know it uh, better, this playwright is very helpful to the actress. There are just patterns of the way he says things that I always know what's coming next because what came before. Uh, so that's been helpful. And then, um, of course, just the standard kind of memorization tricks of, you know, covering the paper and going down line by line by line, making sure you're saying the next line right and then revealing it and seeing if you're right or wrong. Uh, I've worked it with my mother an hour a day. Every single day I have to give her a shout out. Wow. <laughs> but um, but that is how it's really gotten in my head. But the interesting thing is, and I don't know if this is a bad actor habit, but when you're doing a play with other people, you have a moment to be like, what's my next line? Oh, yeah, that's my next line. <laughs> Bad actor. Yes, when you do that. I should not be doing that. But in this play, there's no time for that. Like, actually, if my brain goes there, I'm going to mess myself up. You can't yell off stage line? No. <laughs> I know. There's nothing. So it's like the minute you open your mouth, you just go, go, go. And you were talking about how it, it's written poetically. That has been a little challenging because it feels um, kind of proper and that it's almost um, like like a Shakespearean play and it kind of should be presented that way with uh-huh. perfect diction and dialogue. Um, but now we're at the point where we're finding the differences on where it has to be casual when I'm talking to my husband or talking to my friends in the Air Force with me. And then when there are the points that should be more heightened when I'm talking to the audience and finding the differences in those places is another interesting way to also probably trigger my brain for the lines too. change. Well, how is that executed what you say when you're talking to your husband or friends? <laughs> um, you're, nobody else is there. Nobody's there. I say what they say, basically. Okay. Yeah. But this uh, playwright is very interesting too where he does not want um, the, let's see, I have it here. Oh yes, when the other characters enter the pilot's story, the pilot does not fully inhabit them. She is not an actress. So it's more storytelling of he said this, then I said this, he said this, and I said this. Okay. So that's interesting. That it's not you don't inhabit the other character. Is there any room for improvisation at all, or is it? Mm-mm. It's got to be verbatim. Yep. Okay. It's got to yeah. be verbatim. Yeah, and it's it's so interesting because just like Bianca said, it seems like there's there's something heightened or proper about the way this should be spoken because of the structure of it. But really what he's doing here is he's giving you a clue about what this person's speech pattern is like. And um, we've, we've made decisions for ourselves about how we think her, her speech should be. We've taken a little bit of, um, a Wyoming dialect, which isn't extremely far from a standard American dialect, but we've worked with some vowel changes to get her there. Gee. (laughs) Yeah. And um, just the, the pace and the rhythm of the speech of this person is it's a little bit um, stilted sometimes. It's not smooth. It's not, it's not proper. It's not the way an actor speaks. It's, it's not the way an actor would speak when they introduce themselves in an audition. It's the way this soldier speaks and this woman who spends most of her time around men and has to stand her ground and has to find a way to survive in a world that um, isn't always welcoming to women. And 
we just took all of that into consideration as we were sort of dissecting the language. And then we put it back together. And now we're finding where it needs to be more conversational and how to make this feel more natural for Bianca and where it does need to be heightened so that we can be taken to the next level of the emotion and intensity of the moment. What was the very first rehearsal like? I, I mean, it's, it's such, it's so nonlinear, this type of thing, you know, it's so outside the box. I'm just trying to picture in my mind, you know, with this huge stage you have, one actress, you know, one character. Talk about the, the, first, the very first audition. <laughs> was it awkward? Was it um, strange for both of you in any sense of uh, feeling of being awkward or well, did it, Oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Well, luckily, I mean, we're great friends, so I feel okay. like the fr- there, there wasn't a lot of pressure for the first rehearsal. And usually you start your first rehearsal with a read-through because with a one-woman play and with any play you direct, you don't hear the whole thing really until the first day. Um, so that first day we were just in a conference room and we just read it through. And then Maggie told me her ideas, kind of filled me in on what she was thinking and then I don't know, did we get up on our feet at all that first day? I don't think we did yeah. that first day. Um, and then once it was time to do that, it was just a matter of the two of us deciding together how to map out this world so that it would be clear for her and so that it could then down the line be clear for the audience. Because if if, if Bianca is clear about where she is and her intentions are strong, then we're going to we're going to understand all of it and we're going to be there with her and we're going to believe her. Is there any kind of, you know, the material itself is is so intense. I'm wondering, is there any kind of wave or differentiation of levity at any, at times? Absolutely. And I think that, um, I think that surprised even us throughout (laughs) the process Mm -hmm. because on the page, um, on the page, it does have, a very different tone than when you start to do it in real life and and bring it to life and give it a pulse and it it did take us even from first hearing it a little bit of time to start recognizes the recognizing the moments when um when she's trying to crack a joke <laughs> trying to crack a yeah. joke this is a person with a sense of humor uh-huh. this is a person who can fill a room and who is passionate about her work and who is excited and has a zest for life and we get to see all of that at the beginning we get we're introduced at the beginning to somebody who is extremely charismatic and and interesting and full of energy and then and then we start to see some other levels. So, so there's a, a gradual erosion then. Exactly. Of, I think of, that's a great way to put it, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I was saying, there are so many aspects of this that fascinate me. Um, I've got a friend who wanted me to work with him on a book about his experiences in Vietnam, you know, which are just so bizarre. I mean, it's it's never been in any kind of movie or what. And we were trying to find the uh, the right format. And I, um, I guess about a month ago I said to him... Um, you know, part of me is just seeing this as one person on a stage. Mm-hmm. Um, and the advantage of that is that, um, you know, considering his background and whatever, um, you're not dealing with any kind of, or I should say you would not think you would be th- dealing with any kind of government censorship. Um, is that something that uh, the author had to deal with at all, do you know, or regarding this type mm-hmm. of subject? You know, I don't know. Do you know, Bianca? I don't. I don't know. But I do know that um, a great deal of the content in the play that has to do with, you know, the the technicalities and mm-hmm. the verbiage, it's all accurate. Mm-hmm. And some of the experiences that she has are accurate. So there's a um, lot of technical information. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. And yeah, she, there's something yeah, really... Like, even the the... Um, character description is very clear about what the requirements would be for this person in terms of height and weight. And really? And how many mm-hmm. push-ups they can do and sit-ups and how fast they can run a mile. Like, it's... Wow. Yeah, that, mm-hmm. that, <laughs> yeah those requirements, that's all that is given to us in terms of what, what should be... 
considered Gee. in terms of who, sh- who should be cast. Mm-hmm. It's it's also, you know, incredibly interesting. Can you give us a, a sample, Bianca? Oh, sure. All right. We'll start from the very beginning. I never wanted to take it off. Staring at myself in the mirror, myself in this, I had earned this. This was me now. This was who I was now, who I'd become through sweat and brains and guts. This is me. It's more than a suit. It's the speed. It's the G-force pressing you back as you tear the sky. It's the ride. My tiger. My gal who cradles me, lifts me up, it's more, it's the respect, it's the danger, it's, it's more. It's, you are the blue. You are alone in the vastness and you are the blue. Astronauts, they have eternity, but I have color. I have blue. I am in the blue for a reason. I have missiles to launch. I have sidewinders. I have mavericks. I rain them down on the minarets and concrete below me. The structures that break up the sand, I break them back down. Return them to desert, to particles, sand. At least I think I do. I'm long gone by the time the boom happens. Tiger and I are on to another piece of sky. Boom. Boom. That is captivating. <laughs> That's wonderful. It's quite a way Thank to you. suck you in right from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it just so. I mean, I mean, I've got goosebumps now. It, it just, um, it's chilling. I mean, to hear. I mean, the words and and the way you're doing that. Um, what is the uh, duration of the play? I think ours will come in around the 85 minute mark. I know mm-hmm. if, if we just read it through, the text is exactly an hour. So with acting and transitions and sound cues, okay. probably around there. Don't probably you think? around, yeah, 80, 85. And the play runs, uh, is it May 25th through June 3rd? That's right. So we have a preview performance on the 25th, and then our opening night is Friday the 26th. Okay, and the location of the theater? 300 East Broad Street. It's been an absolute thrill having you ladies here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.